Well, it finally happened. Sandman fans finally got a live action adaptation of the groundbreaking comic book series. With a story that has meant so much to people at a key point in coming to terms with their identity or feeling lost in the world, it was a high risk adaptation that went through many contenders. But now it's a Netflix show. So let's take a dive into that ending and how the comic made the transition to the screen. The first half of the series has a pretty straightforward and relatable issue. Someone has kidnapped Dream and held him prisoner through two generations and over a hundred years. The second half takes us through the events collected in Doll's house. This is where things can get complicated. First, let's review the out loud parts. Rose Walker is the product of a very convoluted plan set in motion by Dream's sibling Desire to destroy Dream by tricking him into breaking an unbreakable rule. The plan was this, a person destined to become a dream vortex, a little hurricane of imagination that starts to bring dreaming and waking life together. That person, one Unity Kincaid, was one of the sleeping victims that resulted when Dream was captured by Richard Burgess, who was looking for Dream's sister Death. The convoluted part comes with this. Desire, generally a trickster among the endless and less generously that family member that's the reason that you don't come home for Thanksgiving, takes the opportunity to impregnate Unity who gives birth while sleeping, the envy of many mothers out there, except for her not knowing and the child being whisked off for adoption. Since the comic started in 1988, Dream's imprisonment was around 70 years. For the adaptation, he's captured at the same time as he was on the page, but he doesn't break out until, you know, modern times. So that's over a century. As a result, there had to be more generations between Unity and eventually Rose Walker. Rose inherited her great-great-grandma's condition as a Dream Vortex, which is so destructive that Dream is compelled to kill her. What Dream didn't know is that Rose is his great-great-niece, and killing family also destroys Dream. Desire was sure to trap Dream in an unwinnable situation, but forgot to take into account that other people and families actually kind of like each other. So Unity took her Vortexness back, allowing for the Vortex to be destroyed without breaking any other rules. Just an easy peasy plan that unfolds over generations. What might not be as clear is why Desire hates their siblings so much that they'd create this elaborate trap in the first place. As they tell their twin Desire, despair and desire are what drives dreams. What creates them? And then they have that stoic, no fun dream walking around like he's above such base things as rampant desire and deep despair. Well, he might be closer to despair, but then he does live in a realm where his creations keep trying to get out and mess around with people, so, you know. Primarily though, is that desire is desire. You don't always have a good reason for how badly you want something. There were some things that were part of Dream's larger story, like his encounter in hell with Nada. It's probably no surprise that Dream is a bit of a moody person to be in a relationship with, especially if you're the queen of the first people and all you really know is that you're not supposed to date the Endless. Knowing she couldn't get involved with Dream but not knowing a way out, she unalived herself. Dream took someone doing this to get out of dating him just a little bit personally, and for her over-the-top rejection, he condemned her to hell. As we see on the way to Lucifer, he still loves her, but clearly hasn't really gotten over it. Whether the show sticks with the reason from the comics remains to be seen. After cursing Lady Constantine for trying to trap Dream and his best buddy Hob, he tells Hob that she helped him out with something important. That would be retrieving the body of Morpheus' son, Orpheus. Dream is endless. With all that time, there are going to be lots and lots of shenanigans just piling up. The big tee-up, however, comes in the form of a still-stewing Lucifer and their need to save face after Dream cleaned up in the world's weirdest game of rock, paper, scissors, where you can pick anything and take turns. As you can imagine, if that was the kind of challenge Dream had to face to get his helmet back, their revenge is not going to be something boring like invading Dream. The next story in the Sandman comics is actually one of the writer's favorite comic book story arcs, Seasons of Mist, where Lucifer does something that he's never done before, quit. He retires and hands the keys to hell over to Dream, putting him in the hot seat over who to give hell to. Something all the pantheons are kind of interested in. In that story, Lucifer cuts off his wings in front of Dream, right before handing him the keys and then heading off to solve crimes in Los Angeles as a consultant and running a piano bar called Lux. Sound familiar? It should, because the series Lucifer was based on the spin-off comic that followed Lucifer after he gave up ruling hell. How much of that the series follows should the show break through Netflix's cancellation hair trigger remains to be seen. But so far, outside of scrubbing most connections to the regular DC universe, the show has been rather faithful to the stories in Preludes and Nocturnes and Doll's House. 
It's a good thing that of all the endless, death is the nice one. Who wants to be guided to the sunless realms by a stoic detached figure or one who has no regard for consequences and less regard for mortals? Instead, death is the character that everyone wants to hang out with. 